two, one, go. There we go. Well, welcome and greetings, friends. Well, Mary Stewart Adams, she has really recognized the need to bring the wisdom of the stars through the lens of anthroposophy. But like you said before, when you were talking about your book, blending it with, with literature and mythology to make it interesting and accessible. So the title that you've coined for your work, this star lore historian, it's, it's as unique and as beautiful as you are, Mary. Yeah. And, and, you know, Mary has this beautiful sonorous voice as well. So we can, we can listen to her, you know, inspire us on her weekly podcast, right? You ever tune into the Storytellers Night Sky? Well, it's just perfect. It's a nice little short bite that you always want more, you know? <laughs> and uh, I think you should hold up your book again. You know, last oh, year, yeah. I can... I, you know, it's the first book. I'm sure there will be plenty more, but the, the Star Tales of Mother Goose and we have to mention that the art was done by your equally amazing sister, Patricia DeLisa, right? I mean, that mm -hmm. yes. really makes it, it's so beautiful. So yeah, I first met Mary when, when we were working together with the Central Regional Council for our theme, Speaking with the Stars. And, and I remember Mary, you were, you were so busy uh, doing these like stargazing cruises on the Straits of Mackinac and uh, you know, working at the International Dark Sky Park at the, at the Headlands in, in Mackinac City in, in Michigan. And boy, we had like a little retreat there and the place is just beautiful nature and just wild and inspiring. So if you can't get down to visit Mary for one of those things, come to, uh, to Santa Fe because Mary will be one of our keynote speakers at the Sophia Rising Convergence in April. So don't forget to sign up, folks, because it's it's filling up fast. And yeah, so for tonight, I, I can't think of a more perfect top topic. You know, Mary's going to take us on a journey through the the current Venus cycle. So welcome, Star Sister. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hazel. So much there that I'd like to respond to, but then we won't finish in two hours. So, but thank you very much, and also thank you, Andre, for. Uh, inviting me and everyone for, for being here. The topic, it's always interesting when you give a topic ahead of time and then you live toward it. I called it Venus and the Foundation Stone and that will be part of what I'm talking about tonight. So hopefully that won't disappoint. I'm going to start right away with sharing my screen. And then if you have questions along the way as Andre shared, please put them into the chat. And if I can, while we're going along, I'll look for it. Um, but if not, then afterward, I can look at those questions. But I would like to start first off and say that in speaking about Venus, I'm going to talk about the planet that we regard astronomically as Venus, which is the one that's closest to the earth, the brightest object in the night sky after the sun and moon. There's also tonight, I'm going to talk about the planet Mercury, so astronomical Mercury, which is the planet we regard as the one closest to, I say we, in astronomy, closest to the sun. And there's this very confounding bit of information from Rudolf Steiner that the names of Mercury and Venus were switched along the way. And that this was done, you could say, as a way to protect certain esoteric information. And in my experience, it's not so easy to just switch the names back and think that you're talking about it correctly. Um, this is something that we have to live into. And my hope is that after what I share tonight that some of us will be inspired to look into the cycle of Venus that we are now in for the next several years and ask this question, is this Venus, is this occult Mercury? How do I enter into this information that Rudolf Steiner shared out of my life experience? Because it's not something that we can just know intellectually. We have to really live into it. So I'm going to start much further back than what's happening in the night sky right now. I want to look first at a very unusual constellation, which is the Capricorn sea goat. And so a sea goat obviously is not a creature that we experience on the earth, but this region of the sky was in ancient cultures regarded as the, let's see, the, we would call it the gateway of the gods. 
So standing opposite is the region of cancer stars, which is the gateway of the human being coming from this celestial spiritual world toward the earth. And then Capricorn would be regarded as the gateway of the gods. And so this is a really interesting creature that Rudolf Steiner wasn't necessarily speaking about Capricorn when he gives this description of the evolution of the earth and the human being and the influence of the stars. But I'm going to read this out. And while you look at that image of Capricorn, see if it doesn't perhaps sound like this. The creatures that were in it, which is this kind of watery environment, but he says it's not quite water. They could not, sw they could not swim in our sense because the water was too thick nor could they walk for one needs firm ground for walking. You can imagine that these creatures had a bodily structure somewhere between what one needs for swimming, fins, and what one needs for walking, feet. So here we have before us Capricorn, a sea goat. It has the, the four feet of a goat or a ram, and the bottom part of its body is a fish's tail. And so without having uh, any kind of indication from the historical research that I've been able to do, what I imagine it's possible that what the ancients were doing, and so this is at least, it comes before, um, it's around the time of the Babylonians and, and into the Egyptian culture where this region of Capricorn is described as a creature this way, where there's the top part of a, a goat or a ram and the bottom part of a fish. It's possible that they were anticipating that there would be a time when across this gateway of the gods something would be happening on the earth. And that it's, it's possible that they were dating that by saying when the point of the vernal equinox, when the sun comes to the celestial equator, which it does every year in the spring in the Northern hemisphere, it would be in the opposite time of year in the Southern hemisphere, that point of spring will, be, will process. It moves one 72nd of a degree every year from one year to the next. So after 72 years, so typical lifespan of a human being in our age, the point of vernal equinox has possessed one full degree of the zodiac. But then after long periods of time, it goes through entire degrees. And so I imagine that this Capricorn sea goat was anticipating the time when the point of vernal equinox was going to pass from the ram or Aries into the fish, Pisces. And so this is moving from this, the, the the age of Aries, which was coincident with the Greco-Roman period of time, the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, and then that point of vernal equinox processed into Pisces, the fishes, and we have the beginning of the Christian era. So I just share this as an imagination when we look at some of the ways that the, the experience of the night sky was depicted. And of course, it wasn't just looking into the stars and saying, oh, that looks like a goat with a fish's tail. It's not really about what the ancients were seeing. It's what do we experience that is flowing toward us from the spiritual world, from the mighty beings of the hierarchies toward the human being from the different regions of the sky. And is it possible that out of reading that starry script, they could anticipate this time when the Christ being would come to earth, which was coincident with this procession of the point of equinox from the ram into the fishes. And so I wanna set up there because I think that there's something really fundamentally important that happens in the history of the anthroposophical movement that is connected to what is happening when we get to this age of Pisces. So the Piscean age described astronomically begins technically in 215 AD and will extend until 2375 AD. Now the cultural age, does not happen the moment that the equinox point processes. It takes about 1200 to almost 1400 years for that to catch up. And so you can just imagine that it's like, we can't really see the history as it's occurring. We can look back and understand, oh, there was the moment when that took place. And while we can perhaps measure, of course, in 215 AD, they weren't using telescopes. They were probably building uh, megaliths still to, to mark where's the sun at the horizon when we're at this point in the cycle of the year when we measured it last year. Um, but so there are certain fundamental celestial rhythms that belong to this delay between the beginning of an age astrologically and then the age uh, culturally. But the traditional glyph for the region of Pisces looks like this. So we have these two vertical lines with a, a horizontal line going through them. And so in, again, imagining what might this mean? What occurs to me in looking at this glyph is that it's coincident, or it seems to me to suggest what Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians from chapter 13, verse 12. 
For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So I imagine these two upright lines, that's the fit one face of the human being looking toward the self. And that that horizontal line is as though the threshold. And so what's happening in this description by Paul is that the human being has come face to face with the self, which is the first experience we, we have when we cross over the threshold into the spiritual world, this encounter with the self. We see ourselves in a way that we can't see ourselves necessarily in the physical world. And so this is this description. Pisces is always um, astrologically described as the most spiritual of the signs. And so this ability to move across the threshold and to find the self. And so I imagine that this, this is the face looking toward itself, both in the physical world and then going across that threshold, that horizontal line into the spiritual world. So we see ourselves one way physically, and then we see ourselves another way spiritually. And that what we see here in the physical world is only a part of our own being. But then when we move beyond that threshold, then we will know even as also we ourselves are known. And so this is a really significant moment in the development of a human being towards spiritual consciousness, which Rudolf Steiner refers to as breaking the inner mirror. So when we look into a mirror, we see ourselves kind of, you know, we're just seeing a reflection. We don't see an animate object. We see a reflection. It's not living. And that when we look into our nature, we can kind of bump into this reflection. It's kind of like a memory mirror. And that there's an indication from Rudolf Steiner that we need to break this mirror to pass through to really get to the true nature of being human and that we can prepare ourselves through spiritual exercise for that, or it can happen suddenly and it can be quite shocking when we come into an encounter with the self when we don't realize that that's what we're seeing. But so this face to face moment is something that is, I think uh, it's, a, it's a characteristic mood of the entire Piscean age. We're moving from in this, how the, the ancients showed this Capricornian image of moving from the ram into the fishes, that we've now come into this region of the fishes and now we see ourselves in the physical world and in the spiritual world. So this entire Piscean age is about moving across this threshold and encountering ourselves physically, spiritually, physically, spiritually, waking and sleeping. And that this will be an experience that we, should be attending to throughout this entire age in preparation for the next age. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and hopefully it will make sense why I started here and showed these things first. And I want to look at the document that was laid into the earth on September 20th in 1913 with the foundation stone of the building of the first Gartianum. And so at the base of this document, there was written uh, an inscription that says, laid by the Johannes Building Association on the 20th day of September, 1880, after the mystery of Golgotha, that is 1913, after the birth of Christ, when Mercury as evening star stood in Libra, the balance. So I was reading that from Elizabeth Breda's book that is just the, all of her letters. And she gives, goes on to give an explanation that this was talking specifically about Mercury, astronomically, the planet that we know that is closest to the sun. And a lot has been written about this, but I want to point out something that I think is quite interesting about this, this moment and also what was informing this moment. So here we have, I'm not going to explain this entire document, but this is laid with the foundation stone, a 12-sided double dodecahedron that was placed into the earth as the foundation stone for the building of the first Gertianum. And so this here then is just the floor plan of the first Gertianum. And then you would be looking west to out the, the, the entrance on the west side where we have the red window. And then, oh, I just wanna mark the east so that we have the directions. And so if you imagine if you were standing where the representative of humanity, the, the sculpture was intended at the back of the stage, looking up that uh, aisle way out toward the west entrance of the building, then you would be looking west. So. 6.37 o'clock in the evening on September 20th, 1913, as this foundation stone was being laid into the earth, Mercury was there as the evening star. And so this is, as I said, the planet that is closest to the sun, astronomical Mercury, Mercury identified that way in the document. So even though Rudolf Steiner has been talking about this switch between Mercury and Venus, at this very sacred moment, 
He calls out Mercury astronomically. He doesn't call it occult Venus, at least not in this document. And what Elizabeth Vita goes on to describe is very much about the planet Mercury. And I think this is important to pay attention to when we try to wrestle with what is it about this switch between Venus and Mercury and how can we understand it? And this is why I consider what I'm going to now give us as an invitation to take up some research to see if we can answer the question, what does it mean that those names have been switched? So I want to show us a couple of astrological charts. So I apologize if you've never seen this before. So what you're looking at is just a wheel of, you imagine standing on the earth at the very center of this circle, and then around you, everything is positioned where it would have been in the sky at that moment. So there's a line that goes right through the middle that would be considered the horizon line. Everything above that horizon line would have been visible in the sky. Everything below that horizon line would have been beneath the earth if you were in Dornoch at 8.30 p.m. or 6.30, excuse me, p.m. Cent uh, Central European time on that date, and I've just circled the planet Mercury. So you can see that looking toward the west, this is the west side of the chart where it looks at, or I put that big white circle, that's where Mercury was. The sun had just set, so Mercury was there as the evening star. So this is an interesting astrological picture. I'm not going to interpret it, but I just want to give us another uh, inner picture of like, what, wh where is it? What am I seeing? So we've got the symbol for Mercury there. And then this is in the West. And so we can imagine that the documents, the stone itself, the location of where this was going to be placed didn't just happen all at that moment, that this was prepared for. This was a moment that was being prepared for. The site had been chosen. The foundation stone had been created. This document that was laid with the stone was created and the moment was chosen. And so if we look into what else was happening at that time, I think it starts to tell a really beautiful picture about what informed this activity, this deed at this moment. So we have to actually look a few days earlier when Mercury came conjunct the sun. So this happened on September 15th. So it was about five days ahead of this ceremony of laying the foundation stone, Mercury and the sun were together in the sky. Mercury was what, what, at what's called superior conjunction. So what happens is the planet Mercury as it's going around the sun will sometimes be, be between earth and sun. Sometimes it's on the other side of the sun from the earth. So it's when it's lined up in the same degree of the zodiac between earth and sun, we call that inferior conjunction. So it's closest to us. And then when it's on the opposite side of the sun from the earth, we call it superior conjunction. So it's on the other side. And Elizabeth Rita, in talking about the planet Mercury, says, indeed, it's not incorrect to imagine that Mercury is to the sun as our moon is to the Earth. So it's kind of like this guardian body. This is me now. Guardian body that's going around the sun, uh, uh, mythologically referred to as the fleet-footed messenger of the gods. And so we have the moon also then orbiting around the Earth. And so that day on September 15th, five days before the foundation stone was laid, not only was Mercury at superior conjunction with the sun, but there was a full moon that was totally eclipsed. So we have this really interesting setup where we've got moon on the opposite side of the earth from the sun and Mercury on the opposite side of the sun from the earth. So the lineup you could imagine is full moon totally eclipsed by the shadow of the earth, the earth itself, the sun, and then Mercury. So this starts to build a really interesting picture that might inform a ceremony, a, 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 an idea about how you're going to take an under, undertake an activity that is described as the microcosm being laid into the macrocosm. And we have this really lovely coincident relationship between the sun and its closest orbiting body that's similar to the earth and its closest orbiting body and what I imagine at that moment is that, with, so this is the traditional symbol for the earth with the moon. So moon, remember, was at total eclipse. There's the sun with Mercury on the other side of it. And that at such a moment, when the guardian bodies of earth and sun are on the opposite side, it's as though the earth and the sun at that moment come face to face. So the moon, 
can be, you know, in every 28 day cycle is passing half the time it's between earth and sun and then the other half it's on the other side. Mercury is also going very quickly through to, to get them where you've got both the moon and Mercury on opposite sides and the moon at a total solar, a total lunar eclipse and Mercury at superior conjunction at the same moment is really rare. And so to me, it seems like this was the aspect that kind of sounded the note for making ready now for this deed that was going to be undertaken. This really sublime deed that belongs to the deepest mysteries of our fifth post-Atlantean epic. And that this sinking of the microcosm into the macrocosm is informed by this setup that happened actually five days before the ceremony of laying the foundation stone. And so then what happened is Mercury moved on from its superior conjunction with the sun, moved ahead of it, which means that we would see it in the evening sky after the sun set. So that then on September 20th, 1913, as the sun was setting and Mercury appeared as the evening star, then the foundation stone was laid during this lunar cycle where we had a total lunar eclipse. So I really, this is not necessarily the greatest graphic to demonstrate this, but if we just try to imagine it, that there isn't anything standing between earth and sun. Of course, we've got the planetary spheres, but there isn't a planetary body that's there between earth and sun. And at this moment, they are in the Piscean age standing face to face. And that this laying of the foundation stone is an invitation for all of us to cross this threshold into an awareness of our true spiritual nature together with one another. This foundation stone is not just for the individual, it wasn't just for a structure, but it's about a community of humanity that's awakened to its spiritual nature. Okay, so I'm not working from notes, and so my notes are here on the screen, so you'll bear with me if I have to pause and then think, oh, what did I put up there next that I wanted to talk about? But so this also is, um, this is the chart that I cast for this, the moment of full moon, on September 15th in 1913. So the earth, you would imagine right there at the center where I put that star. And then on one side, you've got the moon very close to its node, that horseshoe figure is called the node. When the moon is new or full close to that point, then we have an eclipse because that's the point where the, the planes of orbit intersect and everything lines up. So you can see that the moon was very close to its node opposite the earth from where the sun and Mercury were. So this imagines the earth at the center with sun and Mercury on one side, moon on the other side. But I was imagining a more reciprocal relationship between sun and earth where they're standing face to face, their guardians are on opposite sides and something sacred can pass between them. All right, so now um, let's see. I also wanted to point out that Right now, okay, so this again is the chart I already had there from the laying of the foundation stone on September 20th in 1913. I'm going to put up another chart that is a double wheel. The inner part of the wheel is the configuration that we're looking at right now and the outer part of the wheel. So this is where now you've got the node. Okay, let me, let me pause for just a moment because I feel like I'm not explaining all of the pieces. The node of the moon is the Point, two points in space that describe the intersecting orbits of Earth and Moon. And they, they're not static. And while everything in this chart is moving counterclockwise, the nodes move clockwise. They're connected rhythmically to the destiny forces in the life of an individual, and they have an 18 and a half year rhythm. And so you can imagine that the node is like an opening in the Moon's orbit around the Earth where when a deed such as something like the foundation stone is laid, an inscription is being made into the starry spiritual world. So it's like the gateway that the, is, is in the orbital path of the moon. It's where the opening is. So the south node would be the opening through which the soul that's coming toward incarnation is bringing the forces of destiny into this, into this earthly sphere and earthly realm. The north node is the signature of what do I intend to do with that? Or in this case, I'm looking at this, you could say this is the birth moment of this foundation stone. It's laid into the earth and it's through that north node that an inscription is being made into the celestial environment that this deed has taken place on the earth. And so on April 12th, what's coming up in just a couple of weeks, 
you can see that the planets Neptune and Jupiter are going to come conjunct one another within two degrees of where the north node of the moon was when the foundation stone was laid. As an astrologer, to me, that says a lot. This is a call. This is the sounding out of a certain region of the zodiac that bears the memory of this deed. Hazel Straker in describing the events that happened celestially during the time that the Christ was incarnate on the earth said that each deed and each gesture was like the crafting of a mighty cosmic lyre around the earth. And that when the celestial configurations repeated over time, it was like the sounding out of a note on that cosmic lyre and that it was for us to hear it. May human beings hear it. And so we could look at the same moment of the laying of the foundation stone, and that now with on April 12th, 2022, so that will be what, Tuesday of the Holy Week, we have Jupiter and Neptune coming together very close. This would be called a conjunction, just within two degrees of the North Node, of the, the foundation stone uh, itself, of that when it was being laid. So Jupiter and Neptune, they first met in the 1800s, about 10 years after Neptune had been discovered. They were in this region of the sky. And now here they are uh, this many you know, decades later, over a hundred and I okay, can't do the math on the spot, but from 1840, 56 until now, this is the first time they've met again in this region of the Zodiac. So Jupiter carrying cosmic wisdom, uh, expansion, Neptune has a certain relationship to creativity, but also to spirituality. They both are regarded astrologically as rulers of the, uh, the Pisces, the, con the sign of Pisces. Tropically, they are both in Pisces, but I'm showing a chart that's cast in the sidereal zodiac. So you can see that they're actually in the later regions of Aquarius. Um, but I, as an anthroposophist, think that this is something really worth paying attention to. So by paying attention to what I mean is um, looking at one's relationship to the foundation stone, not only to the stone itself, but to the meditation, to the foundations of the anthroposophical movement, to its history, to where it stands now in relationship to that history, to what things are being undertaken that uh, can sound out a certain rhythmic fulfillment of intentions that were laid down then. Uh, in 1913. We're over 100 years past that time, but this is something that doesn't happen that often. Uranus, uh, excuse me, Jupiter and Neptune have not met in this region of the sky since the 1800s, since before, just before the time when Rudolf Steiner was born. So something was coming. The Michaelic age was just about to dawn, and now they're meeting, and it's not a coincidence to me, it's not happenstance that they're meeting right at the north node of the foundation stone. This is a call. And so I just wanted to point out that, so Neptune was discovered in 1846 and it was actually quite close to the planet Saturn when it was discovered. Um, but its first recorded conjunction with Jupiter then happened in March of 1856. So this is something I would you know, mark in your calendar, pay attention to it's occurring during the Holy Week. Um, so I think that that gives us a, a certain signature to what the, that Holy Week celebration will be about this year. But then also, what I wanted to talk about is Venus, as was in the title. All right, so this is the traditional glyph for the planet Venus. And again, talking astronomically uh, about the astronomical planet, the, the brightest object that we see in the sky after sun and moon. Right now, Venus is the brightest star in the morning sky, which would traditionally give it the name morning star. And I want to look now at the opening, not the opening of the Christmas conference, which happened on December 24th in 1923, but the second day of the Christmas conference, which was Christmas day, December 25th at 10 a.m. when the foundation stone as a meditation was first spoken. So this wasn't spoken out on the first day of the conference, but actually began at 10 a.m. And you can see in the East, the planet Venus was rising. So this to me is just a beautiful, beautiful picture. As the foundation stone was being laid into the earth on September 20th in 1913, Mercury was as evening star in the West. And now 10 years later, we get to the Christmas conference. The foundation stone as a meditation is first being spoken. And at that moment, Venus is rising in the East. 
So here we stand between these two celestial bodies. You know, if their names have been switched, it's still these two. And that there is a deep mystery in their having separated that it seems to be connected to this time during the ancient Lemurian period when the division of the sexes happens in the evolution of the human form. And that there will be a time in the future when we are no longer reproducing the way we do in our time. And it seems to be connected to the relationship between these two planets, between Venus and Mercury, or to what lives in the spheres that we identify that way. And that these two are connected because they are below the sun in terms of relationship with the earth. They're more connected to the forces of destiny in the human biography, whereas the planets that are above the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, are more connected to liberating forces. And so Rudolf Steiner is performing these sacred deeds in harmonious relationship with the gesture of these two destiny forming planets, the one that is uniquely related to our experience of our moral nature and the other to our life of uh, religious devotion or spirituality. And so this is making a very strong statement about here's, here's something that is informing these deeds that I'm undertaking. And it, I, it's not happenstance, it's, it's, it's by design. It's not just that, uh, I, I don't believe that Rudolf Steiner was looking at an ephemeris to predict you know, what's going to happen and I take my step at that moment, but that this is, this is an initiate who's working in harmony with a celestial gesture. And we can see it in the signature of the cosmos at the moment that he undertook his particular, uh, these sublime deeds. All right, so Venus in its uh, motion around the sun will appear to make over an every eight year period, five loops, which will give us the impression on the earth that it's moving retrograde. So when a planet is prograde or in direct motion, it will appear to us on the earth to move from the west to the east against the background of stars. But then on occasion, the planets will appear to go retrograde, in which case they move from the east back to the west. Of all of the planets, Venus, astronomical Venus, does this the least. And over an eight year period of time, Venus will do this five times. It will make five loops. And then at the sixth loop, it will come back to the place where it started. And we get this form that suggests the pentagram, which also informs the pentagon. And the pentagon or this five-sided object is the, um, I don't know how to say this, like the formative form of the dodecahedron. So a, a regular dodecahedron has 12 sides. Every side is a pentagon. And so the foundation stone itself is a 12-sided double dodecahedron. So it seems intimately connected to the rhythm of the motion of the planet Venus. And so what I'm wanting us to look at then is the eight-year cycle of Venus that we're in right now. We could spend a lot of time looking at the eight-year cycle that was coincident with the time when the foundation stone was laid, but I really want us to take hold of this and go forward so that we can, again, do research and knowing the dates can allow us to then start to look into our lives, to look into events that are happening in the world and try to discern what is our relationship now and what have I to offer into this picture? Because a hundred years ago, Rudolf Steiner gave this verse that the stars once did speak to humanity, but now it's our turn to speak. And how do we become aware of our speaking? And no, first, first we have to know, we have to know what's going on and try to build out of the riches that come to us through life experience and through spiritual science, try to build a bridge toward the celestial environment that says, I'm aware that I'm, we, are, uh, we are having a reciprocal relationship. All right, so this, uh, I like to give credit when I can, this image comes from James Ferguson's astronomy explained upon Sir Isaac Newton's principles that was first drawn in 1799. And then here's just a picture of a regular dodecahedron so that everybody could see that. If I, I'm not a mathematician, I got my degree in English literature, but I wasn't very poetic about describing the dodecahedron, but there is one so that everyone can see that. All right, so now I want to look at the, um, the things that 
have informed the Venus cycles that we've recently experienced. So there was a Venus transit. Uh, yeah, let's see, I'm just gonna show a picture of it. So a Venus transit happens once every 120 years. And they'll happen in pairs that are eight years apart. Okay, remember, it takes Venus eight years to make five retrograde loops. So it will transit in front of the sun. And this is what this picture shows us. There's the sun with this black dot, Venus just moving directly in front of it. If this was our moon, we would call it an eclipse. But Venus is too far away and it's too small to actually block the sun. So we just call it a transit. It's moving in front of the sun. So it happened first in June of 2004. And then eight years later, it happened again in 2012. Okay, so 2012 was a pretty big year in the Mayan calendar. It was the fulfillment of the Mayan long count calendar. And it was also predicted at that time that the sun would be coming to its winter solstice moment in the Northern hemisphere. So the December solstice moment directly in front of the galactic center. And that this was going to mark a shift in our experience of the galactic plane actually. And so there was a lot of talk about, okay, this is the end of times. And of course it didn't happen right at winter solstice. It also didn't happen right at the end of the Venus transit. But we could look back and say that there were remarkable things going on that are playing out right now. But so it's been, uh, it was eight years from to the end of the Venus transit in 2012, eight years later, Venus came back to conjunct the sun in June of 2020. But now it wasn't a transit, that transit was done. But over that eight year period from 2012, Venus again made this pentagram. And what I imagine is that when Venus is transiting the sun, it's like it takes a spark of flame, the way the ancient Greeks would describe how Prometheus stole a spark of flame from Helios and brought it to the earth to give it to humanity as a civilizing force. And so when Venus is transiting the sun, Venus is like Prometheus, gathering up that flame and then weaving it as a pentagram around humanity on the earth. And so you could imagine that this was happening either during that eight year period from 2004 to 2012, which is when social media took off and Facebook first went online and there was a lot that was going on with technology and the internet. Or you could say that in 2012, Venus was taking that flame that it had been cultivating and now gifting it over to humanity during the eight years since that time. So from 2012 to 2020. And then in 2020, we had the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. And so this is an image that was taken here in Northern Michigan. You can see the Milky Way coming down into the top of a barn and those two bright lights that are just left of the barn roof. The brighter one is Jupiter and the one immediately to its left is Saturn. So this was just before, this was the summer before they came to their great conjunction. And so the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter happened in 2020, the same year that Venus completed its first eight year cycle since its transit time. So these are just, this is, kind of like a beginning very gently, you know, once upon a time, there was this event happening in the sky. Venus had gathered fire from the sun, had woven a pentagram with the sun around the earth in a cycle of five retrogrades. It brought that flame back to the sun, you could say, in the, in the eighth, if, if, after the eighth year completed. And then these two planets came conjunct as they do once every 20 years. And as Willie Zucker said, when a great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn happens, it demands a decision. All right, so we all know what was happening in 2020. I mean, this was a remarkable year. Not only had Venus completed its first, first cycle of five retrogrades since its transit, not only had Saturn and Jupiter come conjunct, there was a great comet, Comet Neowise, um, there was a lot that was happening celestially that was going on in the sky and a lot that was happening on the earth a lot that was happening for humanity that I think we're still trying to sort out. What does all of this mean? It was definitely a call to be more aware of our environment, to be more aware of our relationships, to be more aware of our healthy engagement with life forces on the earth. Now also, so I, I'm looking at these two because I, I think that the, the eight year period from 2012 to 2020 was perhaps informed by the Venus transit but now we're in a Venus cycle that began in January of this year, 2022, that seems to be informed by the great conjunction. So these are two different moods, flame being gathered to the sun, 
brought as inspiring or um, cultivating cultural life the way it was described by the Greeks, that this is something that was happening during that eight year period of time. Now we've got this great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter informing the next eight year cycle of Venus and decisions have to be made. Something, we, we, we have to come to a certain resolve around something. We can't always know at the beginning what that is. If you imagine being at the beginning of the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, we're standing in front of, front of four paths and how do we determine which one is the one that we're going to take? We could overestimate our capacity and take the, the road of the kings, or we could way underestimate and find ourselves lost. How do we determine what that is? And of course, if you know the chemical wedding, then what happens is it's not out of reason and logic and intellect that he makes that decision. There's some other forces that are operating that seem to like in traditional fairy tale fashion come out of virtue that he has exhibited somewhere else in his life that demonstrates that he has a capacity for a certain path through life. So I also want to point out that on Christmas day, uh, just this Christmas past, NASA launched the James Webb Space Telescope into a point that is really curious to me that's called the Lagrange Point. So this is one of three places around the Earth where the gravitational force of Earth and Sun are such that if you place an object there, it will stay in that place. It won't move. It won't fall toward the Sun. It won't fall toward the Earth. Astronomers have known about this since the 1700s. It's named for the French astronomer, Joseph Louis Lagrange, who was born on this, uh, January 25th in 1736, the Feast of St. Paul. And he set himself the task of trying to understand what he called the three body problem. So this is in classical and celestial mechanics, so-called because three bodies are orbiting each other. And how do you find a relationship, what is the harmony between them? And he was able to figure out that when you have three bodies orbiting each other, there's a point between them where one can be placed where it will remain. And so the James Webb Space Telescope was launched on Christmas day into Lagrange point number two. But what was fascinating to me is that, that Joseph Louis Lagrange was studying this issue between 1764 and 1772. And right smack in the middle of that eight year period, Venus transited the sun. So I'm not saying that that was causal and that Venus is intimately connected with this, but I do think that there's no such thing as a coincidence. And there's something going on that has to do with these points that seem to express a certain harmony of relationship between earth and sun. And with our technological capacity, we're now placing machines there. It's something to think about. Um, and also that it's three bodies that come into a harmonious relationship, which makes me think of the gospel of Matthew where it says, where the Christ being says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And there's this really lovely astronomical phenomena that seems to demonstrate this kind of harmony when two can come together in the name of uh, well, in the gospel, it's in the name of the Christ being, but out of a harmonious encounter with one another, then something happens at that third space. Um, so I just offer this as an imagination about something that's happening in our time. Venus con came conjunct Pluto on Christmas Day. NASA launched this space telescope. We're going to get some fabulous pictures from this space telescope, but it's hanging out there in this region that's one of those places where earth and sun are in this kind of balanced relationship. And thinking about this from the deed of the foundation stone, which seems to be laid out of this gesture of earth and sun coming to this face-to-face -face encounter in this Piscean age, which is itself also about this encounter of the self, the face-to-face, -face. now I know in part, then shall I know even as also I myself am known. I just wanted to show you there's the little image of the James Webb Space Telescope out there at L2. And I also just have to say, it really is overwhelming to me to consider how the human mind can figure something like this out. I have a thing for words. I don't have a thing for numbers. And to think about 
someone being able to figure these kinds of things out is just very, really awesome to me. So it's, it's really inspiring as well, even though I don't like to think about there being machines at that point. So I have to confess that part too, but there's something really, really marvelous about being able to figure that out and to develop the technology to be able to do something like that is incredible. All right, so now getting to what Venus is doing right now. So in every eight year cycle, not only will Venus come to inferior conjunction with the sun where it's moving retrograde. So it's moving from the east back to the west and it will appear between the earth and the sun in the same degree of the zodiac, but it will also in an eight year period have five superior conjunctions with the sun when it's on the other side of the sun from the earth. The dates I'm going to give us are all the inferior conjunctions. And you'll start to see why I think when I show you what I'm seeing in the narrative of what's going on here. So on January 8th, 2022, Venus came conjunct the sun. So I'm regarding that as the beginning of this eight year cycle. So Venus completed its uh, eight year cycle from the transit in June of 2020. And then Saturn and Jupiter came conjunct in December of 2020. And then on Palm Sunday in 2021, Venus was at superior conjunction with the sun. Then it moved on. And then in December, it went retrograde, met the sun on January 8th. So that's the beginning of this eight year cycle. So the second conjunction of inferior conjunction when Venus is going retrograde again, will happen next year on August 13th. So I'm just gonna draw a little line here to join these. And then on March, 22nd in 2025, Venus will meet the sun again. The fourth meeting is going to happen on October 23rd in 2026. Then on June 1st, 2028. And then the final conjunction will happen on January 6th in 2030. So we have this eight year period of time from January 2022 to January 2030 where Venus is going to meet, make these five, six different meetings with the sun. And so we could just leave it at that and say, I'm gonna pay attention to these dates and see what happens, but they also start to reveal something in and of themselves, I think. So January 8th, 2022 is at the beginning of this year, the, the you know, happened just after the fulfillment of the Holy Nights. And in this year on, uh, August 11th, 2022, at the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, which peaks between the 10th and the 13th of August, there's going to be a full moon. Then in 2023, the Venus-Sun conjunction is going to happen right at the peak of the Perseid meteor shower. Then when we get to the 2025 eclipse, you'll see that it's or not eclipse, but conjunction, it's just a few days ahead of the 100th anniversary of the death of Rudolf Steiner. And then in October of 2026, the Venus and Sun conjunction is going to happen just a couple months after there's a total solar eclipse that will happen at the peak of the Perseid meteor shower. So there's this really interesting sounding out that's happening, I think, with the Perseid meteor shower. This year we'll have a full moon. Next year they'll have the Sun-Venus conjunction. A couple years later, we're going to have a total eclipse of the Sun at the Perseid meteor shower. If you look in the Gospel of St. Matthew, there's an interesting description that seems to describe a moment like this, because when there's a total eclipse of the sun, the sky doesn't get completely as dark as it will at night, but we're not seeing the sun, the sky darkens, and because it's the peak of the meteor shower, it will be po possible to see those meteors during the day if you are in the eclipse path. And so in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. When the moon is eclipsing the sun, it's at new phase, so it's not giving any light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. I'm not trying to make any kind of ominous prediction, but just pointing out that that kind of description is describing that moment, a total solar eclipse at the peak of a meteor shower. And then the fifth conjunction of Venus and the sun is going to happen on June 1st, Venus and Mercury will both be retrograde at that time. They will both be conjunct the sun. Uranus will also be conjunct the sun. So this is a pretty potent lineup of planets at that time. And just a couple days later, it will be Whitsun. So this is happening during the 10 days from Ascension to Whitsun in 2028. 
And then the January 6th eclipse is, excuse me, conjunction. I keep saying eclipse. I just mean to be saying Venus Sun conjunction is happening at the Feast of Epiphany. And so I look at this and think that there's a certain, uh, this starts to, if I'm imagining there's a certain call from the spiritual world, that this starts to inform what that call is. And given that it's coincident, there are certain elements of this period of time that are coincident with Perseid meteor shower, that makes me start to think about the will forces of the human being and how Rudolf Steiner describes the relationship between the late summer meteor showers and the Michaelic will. And so I just have here a quote from the Super Sensible Man lecture number three. In our time, it is the impulses contained in the iron thrown out from the sun it has special significance for human beings. And these impulses are used by him whom we know as the Michael spirit in the service of the spiritual in the cosmos. In our age, there are thus present in the cosmos impulses, which were not working with the same strength in earlier periods of civilization. This cosmic iron in its spiritual nature makes it possible for the Michael spirit to mediate between the super sensible and the material on earth. So I've just excerpted this from a long description where he's making a relationship between the meteoric iron that we see flashing through the sky and how this is, a, is uh, related to the activity and the work of Michael and his mediation between the super sensible and the material. And when we look at the Venus cycle from 2022 to 2030 and this sounding out of certain celestial gestures commensurate with that cycle that hit right at the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, it seems to me that this is connected to the activity of Michael. And so I have another quote um, that's describing this. Let me see, I gotta see if I can do something on my screen so I can read all of it. Now man is a true microcosm, really a little world. Everything that manifests in the great world outside and gigantic and majestic phenomena, such as the phenomena of meteors manifests also within in the inward nature of what he is himself as physical being. For this physical being is only an expression, a manifestation of his spiritual being. And so in a certain way we bear within ourselves, starting from the animal lower nature, the sulfurous element. We must say to ourselves, this sulfurous element, this sulfurous, excuse me, this sulfurous aromonic element storms through the human organism, stirs up his desire nature, stirs up his emotions. We feel it within us, we behold it at high summertime in the cosmic desire covering above our heads, but we also behold how into this overarching cosmic desire covering, there shoot the iron arrows of the meteoric phenomena, cleansing and clarifying it, acting as an opposite pole to the animal-like desire nature. For through this shooting in of the meteoric iron arrows from the cosmos, the animal desire covering of the high summertime above us is purified. And what takes place in majesty and grandeur out there in the great cosmos goes on continually also in us. We produce tiny iron particles in our blood in combination with other substances. And while on the one hand, there pulses through our blood, the sulfurizing process, there works against it inwardly, meteorically as the other pole, the iron inside us, bringing about the same process as is affected outside in the cosmos by the meteoric iron. We can then so picture man's relationship to the cosmos that in the flashing meteoric element, we find the cosmic counterpart of what within us is a million upon million fold flashing forth of the meteoric element that sets us free by means of the iron in our blood, cleansing and clarifying us from the sulfurizing process, which is also active in the blood itself. Now I'm certain that most of us are familiar with this, but I wanted to read all of that out because I wanna be, again, draw our attention to the fact that this year, we're not really gonna see the Perseid meteor shower that well because the moon is gonna be full. So the moon kind of gathers up all of the light and it might be possible to see some of them, but this year it's kind of a wash. And I say that because I do, as Hazel mentioned, I do narrate cruises on the Straits of Mackinac all summer long where we get out there on the boats and we go out under the Mackinac Bridge and we cruise out west under the beautiful, beautiful starry sky over Lake Michigan. And I tell the stories of the night sky. And we usually go out at midnight during the meteor showers, but we won't this year because of the full moon. The moon will swallow all of that up. But then, when we get to 2023, 
Now Venus is going to meet the sun at the peak of the Perseid meteor shower. And then three years later, there's going to be a total eclipse at the peak of the Perseid meteor shower. So what does this have to do with, the, with Michael's mediation between the supersensible and the material world? Does it have anything to do with it? It's a, it's a question and it's a question I'm asking myself and that I'm asking all of us by sharing these dates and pointing these things out. But then I also wanted to share that, uh, let me see, I'm gonna got to close that so I can read this out. The objective fact is simply this, that in November, 1879, beyond the sphere of the sense world, in the super sensible world, that event took place, which may be described as follows. Michael has gained for himself the power. So this is the beginning of the Michaelic age, 1879. So right now I really just wanted to just imagine uh, mathematically a little bit about where we are because recently I've heard some talks, I think even here with uh, guests that Andre has had, that there is as though, I, I wanna say this, um, with deepest respect, it's a very tender topic, that it's as though the anthroposophical impulse in a certain respect has failed because of certain things that didn't happen by the end of the 20th century. And I have to say that for myself personally, I don't feel that way um, because I feel that there is a certain timing element that is involved that has not yet fulfilled itself. And that when we count, uh, um, when we look at astronomical rhythms, but then we also look at what Rudolf Steiner was doing in particularly in establishing the calendar of the soul. He counted not from the birth of the Christ child, the way it's recorded in the Gregorian calendar, which would say that now we are in the year 2022, but he begins with the mystery of Golgotha, which you could say then is actually 33 years later. And not just trying to make the case that, okay, we've got until 2033, until we're at the turn of the century, but to really kind of try to penetrate this mystery of what is it that's being indicated in what's called the Michael prophecy about how anthroposophists, if they were strong enough in their intention and their will could incarnate again very quickly at the end of the 20th century in order to fulfill a deed. And so it seems to me that this indicates that one would have to have incarnated before the end of the 20th century in order to be of an age so that when these 100 year rhythms in the anthroposophical movement were sounding out because of its relationship to the mysteries of the Rosicrucian stream, that you would have to be of an age already in order to really be able to act as a spiritual scientist or an esotericist in the world. And that that would imply that you've got to incarnate before the end of the 20th century so that by the time we get to the sounding out of these rhythms, you're at least 30 years old, perhaps even 40 years old, as Rudolf Steiner wrote in his biography, uh, teaching from esotericism before the age of 40 can have error in it. And so I'm not saying that these are things, um, I'm not in any way trying to pretend like I'm an authority on what this is, but this in part informs an idea that I have that we aren't there yet. We're getting there and we're very close, but we haven't missed it. And that something does, uh, it, again, in the John gospel, it's except a corn of wheat fall into the earth and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Something has to go across the threshold and as those seem to disappear and go asleep so that then it can blossom forth with the fullness of what it has to offer. And so I just have was imagining that, okay, so 1879 is the beginning of the Michaelic age, a hundred years later would have brought us to 1979. And then if we add the Christ rhythm to that of 33 years, we get to 2012. Oh, this is the year that the Venus transit happened. I'm not saying anything conclusive about this. I'm just saying, this is the way I kind of meander through and say, hmm, does that have anything to do with what's going on? And that particular Venus transit informed this eight year cycle that went from 2012 to 2020. And during 2020, not only did Venus complete its first cycle of five retrogrades, we had the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, but there were also five metonic cycles since Rudolf Steiner's death that also culminated in 2020. So the metonic cycle is a rhythm of the relationship between earth and sun, excuse me, sun and moon with the earth so that you, after 19 years, you come to the same relationship where there the moon is going to be new or full on the same days in the same degree of the zodiac. So that had happened five times since Rudolf Steiner died in, by the time we got to 2020, we had the five retrogrades of Venus. We had the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. So there was this 
rhythm sounding out in that period of time. And then we have the eight year Venus cycle now that began in January of 2022, that's going to culminate at Epiphany 2030. So 2030 marks the 100, uh, the 100 year rhythm since the beginning of the decade that Rudolf Steiner indicated there would be the greatest mystery of our time, which is the beginning, not the end, but the beginning of the reappearance of the Christ in the etheric. And so to me, it feels that this eight years from 2022 to 2030 is really critical in terms of our really coming to terms with that mystery. Uh, that's not the right way to say it, but really getting ourselves familiar with it. And if we're not having that experience, trying to, to strengthen our capacities for knowing that that is a reality and not just something that was spoken a hundred years ago. So I wanted to actually look at something that Rudolf Steiner said in relationship to Rosicrucianism, where he says it was established that all the discoveries that they made, the Rosicrucians made, had to remain the secret of the Rosicrucians for a hundred years. And that not until a hundred years had passed might these Rosicrucian revelations be divulged to the world. For not until they had worked at them for a hundred years might they talk about them in an appropriate way. So one can imagine that if you're a Rosicrucian and you're doing research, that you're probably already an adult and the lifespan isn't going to, you know, if you're in your 30s, you're not going to live to be 130. So this 100 years implies that you're not only going to be taking this revelation across the threshold of waking and sleeping, but also across the threshold of death and back into birth. And so there is this necessity of carrying it across the threshold into the spiritual world fully, coming back into, the birth, into birth, finding it again, and then working it so that after a hundred years have passed, now this can be brought out into the world. So I, I think about these mysteries and these activities, these deeds of Rudolf Steiner in that respect, and that we are just now coming to the 100 year sounding out of these rhythms. In 2022, we have the 100th anniversary of the economics course that was given in the summer of 1922. We have the 100th anniversary, I call it an anniversary of this verse about the stars spoke once to humanity. And then of course, we have the very sobering anniversary on December 31st of the fire that destroyed the first Gertianum. And then when we get into 2023 and 2024, now these 100 year rhythms are starting to sound out. And Venus is poised at this place at the beginning of the year in relationship to the sun, where an eight year cycle is beginning that's going to culminate in 2030, which marks the 100 year rhythm of the decade when the reappearance of the Christ is going to be occurring. So this is the picture that I'm seeing that's informing what, what I'm looking at and trying to understand as an anthroposophist, how am I connected to this? Who am I? Who are we? What are we doing? And how do we go forward? So uh, let's see what else. Is. This is from the true nature of the second coming, which was a lecture that Rudolf Steiner gave when he first spoke about the reappearance of the Christ in the etheric, that he spoke this on January 25th in 1910 which is the feast of Paul's conversion at the gates of Damascus. And as you know, he pointed out that Paul in his experience on the road to Damascus was the first human being to experience this etheric Christ the way later humanity and we in particular, because we are living in the era when this mystery was first revealed, will have come to an experience of this Christ event in our time. All right, so. I just wanted to show you very quickly part of what I did. I have this here with me. Um, not something that you necessarily need to copy, but what I did was with my sister, Patricia, hers is much more beautiful than mine. But I imagined the, um, let's see, Margot Rossler, who at, worked with the new, image, the new images of the Zodiac that had been created by Rudolf Steiner's colleague, um, Ima von Eckerdstein for the original calendar of the soul. She also did a planetary Zodiac. So, there's the sun zodiac, but then she went through each planet. So we drew the image of Venus in each region of the zodiac where it will come to its conjunction with the sun. And then I just put the dates and then I was imagining the chapter 20 of the John gospel and picking up the different verses to see if that might reveal part of the narrative. I'm going to move past this, but just so that you can see that this was me attempting to work with it artistically. 
And then I just wanted to close with this verse from chapter 20, verse 30 of the John Gospel. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And for me, that's really that, you know, if to, if to imagine that they're written, where are they written? They're written in the stars. And we are called to be aware that we are writing in the stars as well. And it's our time now. Okay. So there. Thank you, Andre. Yeah. <laughs> thank mm. you. <laughs> Dear Mary, thank you so much for your super intense and wonderful presentation. So, and we are going to move to our answers and uh, questions and answers um, uh, section. But before, I would propose uh, if we will take three minutes break. Please have a sip of water, move around to do, you can do your rhythmic gestures and be back fresh with your <laughs> questions uh, in three, four minutes. So, oh, thank you so much. Andre, this is Hello. Laureen. This Who's is it? Laureen. And oh, hi, would, Laureen. Hi. Um, when I try to start my video, it says the host has me, uh, will not allow me to. Is that true? Do you have that? Uh, let me see. Ask to start the video. Okay, try, try it right now. There you Excellent. are. Excellent. Now, <laughs> I see your face. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, okay, so uh, dearest friends, are you ready? Um, <clears throat> so in the bottom of your stream, you will find icon uh, reaction. So click on it and uh, there is a button raise hand. <clears throat> uh, we have almost 100 people online listening, uh, Mary. And uh, um, I would ask, just please, uh, I mean, your statements are also welcome. <laughs> but if you can stick this topic of presentation and be as short as possible, because we're trying to accommodate all of you, so uh, please do it. Uh, yeah, and it's nice if you will uh, show your real name. <clears throat> And uh, if you can show your face too. Uh, yes, thank you so much. And uh, first question from Elia. Eli. Yeah, go ahead, please un unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I just had a question to Mary about the, if she could just, well, I got two questions now that you show up. Is that a Nike of Thamothrace? Behind you, or is that an Archangel Michael and the dragon? To your right shoulder or behind you? Andre, he's asking you about your statue. Oh, yeah. oh okay. This is a statue of, um, well, I mean, you asked me, I forgot immediately. Ala. Is it a Nike of Samothrace or Michael and the dragon? No, it's not Michael. Oh. It's yeah, a Nike, second. that's what it is, a Nike. Nike. Is it looks free. like Nike. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mary, I, I, I had a question for you, but I'm always intrigued with these rhythms because the one you coaxed out is, no, is I'm very dear to our hearts, so to speak, in America, which was the year 1933. And 1933 in America was when Roosevelt declared war on the American public and confiscated all their gold. Mm. And later I found an original model of that design of that $20 gold piece that had archangelic wings on it. Mm. So if you put the year 1933 and combine it with the archangelic uh, figure, it's the reappearance of Christ in the etheric, yeah. wouldn't yeah. it? It seems like it. I mean, it's beautiful. I think even if, you know, if, if Roosevelt didn't know or the Minter didn't know, the, the artist didn't know, it's still an inspiration that's coming from somewhere. It's trying yeah. to present itself into the consciousness. Yeah. That is beautiful. And somebody found the, the original plaster model design and out of Li Liberia, they actually started striking these one ounce gold coins with the archangelic wings on them. And I put one of those up in my money group. Mm, but the other question I had, I, I'll be short with this is, you mentioned about the 33 year rhythm in 1879 and Rudolf Steiner was what? 18.3 in 1879. And then you go to 1912. And have you ever seen the front cover of the original Soul Calendar, Mary? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where yeah, I guess. So, uh, huh? Well, I was just drawing attention to the dates that he puts there about how he's counting from the mystery of Golgotha or the, the birth of the eye. I think. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, described. that's what I kind of wanted to. Yeah. 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 Okay, you got that. I was curious about that. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. I so I think it's 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 a it's a. It's an interesting question that I think we have to ask ourselves. Can we really discern in our, in the way we measure time? You know, and this, this does change over time. And it wasn't until that decade of the early 1900s that the Gregorian calendar became the universal civic calendar. Almost simultaneously, Rudolf Steiner introduced the calendar of the soul so that you have this fixing of a universal civic calendar around the world and then the introduction of this spiritual calendar that's going to move its starting date every year in order to keep the forces of the human being awake in this experience of the time body. So I think that that's something we should really be looking at ourselves at how we, you know, 
can we really sense that this, it's not a discrepancy, but the difference in this rhythm between the, the 33 years that are counted from the birth of the Christ child to that time of the, the resurrection and the mystery of, of the birth of the eye. So that would be 2033. Right, right. Well, it's in every 100 years, that 100 year rhythm. Yeah, yeah. But I really like what you presented overall. I just had one caveat. Okay. And that is the, <laughs> how can I say this? I loved what you said, but if you would slow it down a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the pace, the pace of a delivery is as important as the content. Yes. Your content was stellar. Yeah. I, I would just let, I, if I could encourage you, it'd be just a slow. I, I appreciate that. Thank you for saying so. And I, I do apologize to everyone. I will share that as a presenter in this medium, part of what I experience is like, it's a bit like getting on a horse and toward the end, that horse really started to gallop and I couldn't rein it in. And it's, <laughs> yeah. I try, I tried, I tried. But it just starts coming. So uh, there isn't the because we're not living in the warm presence of one another's hearts. And if we were, then I would be feeling something back from you that would help me to temper that. But it does. It, it, it wants to keep flowing because I. It's like it's looking for where is that boundary? I, I can't find. And so I apologize that I to hold that simultaneously as i'm trying to deliver the content it's it, it requires some muscle that i don't have fully so i'll try thank you my sister said the same thing yeah you'll be like a cut gemstone next time yeah. or you, you do that. like like a dodecahedron pyrite right 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 thank you thanks elia oh, thank you so Good much yeah, just uh, the answer. This is uh, Nika Samofrakin, which yeah, is nice representa uh -huh. representation of Eurythmy. Oh, I yeah. I purchased it specifically for my wife, and she said it's perfect. Wings and absolutely headless. You know, representation of uh, goddess of Eurythmy. Say it again. The Greeks would put that on the prow of their ship. Their wooden ship, so they had a wooden carved Nike. Nike often appears on the backs of some of the Greek coins. She's the, she often crowns the charioteer with a laurel wreath. Mm. So she was beloved by the Greeks. We actually say Archangel Nike. Even so. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, Daniel Perez, Daniel. Hi. Oh yeah. Um, I believe that you mentioned the chemical wedding of yes. Christian Rosenkreutz. Yes. And um, I didn't completely catch um, while you're on your gallop. Um, <laughs> I didn't Sorry. completely catch the reference because um, he gives several astronomical references throughout the chemical wedding. There's one of them at the end of the fifth day, um, and he talks about a conjunction but there's a couple of them. So I just was wondering if you could just, I love that. I love the chemical wedding. So I just yeah, wanted to get that yeah. reference. You know, thank you for bringing it up. I also love the chemical wedding. And I was referencing what happens on day two when he has to choose a path, but there, uh, he doesn't actually give a specific reference to what that conjunction was that he sees on the end of the fifth day. You know, he says, I had, you know, it was clear and I got, I went out and it was about midnight and I got to, you know, observe better the night sky and saw that there was a rare lining up of the planets, the like to which was not to be seen anytime again soon. I do right. know that the chemical wedding first appeared in the early 1600s. And in 1603, there had been a great um, a supernova that came to be known as Kepler's star. And in nine months after that, in October, November of 1604, so just as the chemical wedding is, the manuscript of it is appearing, the astronomy community was looking toward this great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter because it had moved on, but Mars was about to join up with them. And the astrologers from the Middle East were prophesying that when Mars comes to Saturn and Jupiter around the time of a great conjunction, you should be looking for 
a comet or something else happening in the sky that will indicate the signature of that conjunction. So every, they were all, I'm saying it this way, they were looking towards Saturn and Jupiter and this supernova exploded. Wow. So this is happening at the time that the chemical wedding was first appearing. And that, that Kepler star is oftentimes referred to as the opening of the tomb of Christian Rosenkreuz. So, so one, one last thing is that then he also goes down into the tomb of Venus and mm -hmm. uncovers Venus sleeping. Yes. Is that connected at all? Like, is that an astronomical reference or is that just purely like a spiritual being reference, do you think? So, okay, that's a big question. And I think that right now, the way I'm living with it, I, I believe that it has to do with the... The way Venus is connected to, I'll call it a Luciferic tendency. And so this seven day trial of the chemical wedding is a, um, an initiation through a purification of the soul body. And that at that moment, when he descends and seemingly unwittingly sees the tomb and, and sees Venus unveiled, that at that moment, this is a demonstration of his having purified his desire body or the passion body. Rudolf Steiner gives a lecture that I apologize, I, I can't give you the exact reference, but it's talking about the sacredness of the mass and how the first part is about the catharsis and the second part is about the sacrifice. And he gives an example of the purity of the fine gemstones and how this was like the, the that there's no desire, there's no, um, there isn't a passion. I was just reading this this morning, sorry that I can't pull it up, but that, that this would be the state of soul that the would-be initiate was striving toward. And so I think that that moment that he sees Venus, there's a demonstration of his capacity of having mastered the passionate desire within himself. And then when Cupid pricks him, he bleeds, which is a, a testament to the fact that he is still a human being that still has this astral body, but that he has mastered it. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, and then it, it goes on. I love the chemical way. So. Yeah, thank Thanks you, thank asking. you. That was really yeah. nice. Thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Benjamin is next, Benjamin. Yes, Benjamin thank you so himself. much for your talk, Mary. I, I wanted to ask you, if you were uh, aware of the 33 year rhythm that Dr. Koenig spoke about as a generation and that the 60s generation really began with the, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. And if you take 33 years from then, the 1979 or so, oh, it was the beginning of what the, is called the millennial generation and then 33 years after that, that is 2012, which was you you referred to um, in relation to the Mayan calendar. So I think of it as the Mayan generation, possibly. And and I I don't I just I've always been curious how that works in in relation to the actual beginning of this rhythm um, with the with the birth of of Jesus in 33 years later because that would be as as the other person mentioned a hundred year every hundred years it would be exactly um that so i just wondered if you had any thoughts about that or if you were aware yeah, of i haven't i haven't studied that in carl koenig i certainly you know have contemplated this 33 year rhythm but specifically because you mentioned hiroshima i'm i would share that i look at that in relationship to the eclipse cycles because the atomic bomb was first tested in July of 1945, and there had been a total solar eclipse just prior to the test on July 16th. And so the first use of the, you know, the first use of the atomic bomb happened during this lunar cycle that totally eclipsed the sun. And so eclipses happen, they're, they're um, organized according to something called Seros cycle. And so that was Seros cycle number 145. And after 72 years, that cycle completes, no, it doesn't complete, but it will recur. So 72 years after 1945 would have brought us to 2017. 
And in 2017, there was a total solar eclipse that went from coast to coast across the United States. And it went over Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is a community that was only built in order to enrich uranium in order to split the atom to create that bomb. And there's a lot that goes into this picture in part that is going to inform what I'm bringing in to New Mexico because there is a, a mighty rhythm sounding out in relationship to that eclipse. And I'll just say that between 2017, the, the last total solar eclipse shadow that fell across the United States and the next one that's happening in 2024, they're seven years apart. They're not in the same Saros cycle, but in every cycle of seven, the midpoint seems to uh, give an indication about kind of the, 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 the whole narrative, what's happening in that cycle of seven. And so from 2017 plus four years, that puts us at 2021. So let me just back up a little bit and say that the earth is exhibiting three motions. It's rotating on its axis, gives us day and night. It's orbiting the sun, which gives us the cycle of the year. And then it's slightly wobbling. And that wobble is what's causing the precession of the equinox and our changed relationship over time to the stars. And so the wobble occurs at a rate of 172nd of a degree each year, or every 72 years, the earth has wobbled one full degree of the zodiac. Now, Rudolf Steiner points to this as being uniquely connected to the biography of an individual in that the star that shines over our birth, that it's as though the sun says to our star when we are born, while that human being is there in the physical world, I will carry the relationship for you. But then after 72 years, the earth has wobbled and it's as though the sun moves off that relationship and we come back into direct relationship with our star. Now, not everybody is going to live to be 72 and some will live well beyond that time, but there's a certain celestial fulfillment that happens at that moment. So you could say, again, research wise, what was the star that shined over that moment of splitting the atom and using it as a bomb? And is that related to what happened 72 years later when we had the next eclipse and four years after that, we're in global pandemic. Is this connected? Is this the fallout of that? So I haven't looked at it in the 33 year rhythm, but I have looked at it in the eclipse rhythm. And it's remarkable what sounds out in the eclipse rhythm between then and now. It's staggering actually. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That could, that could be a whole lecture by itself. <laughs> it will be in, in New Mexico. That's part of it, yeah. It's a birthday present because I'm about to Turn 72, thank uh -huh. you. Well, so then you can, now you can say, I find my star and my star finds me. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Um, dear friends, it's no questions. Oh no. no. Statements. Yeah, please go ahead. Yaya, Yaya from London. Hello, please unmute yourself. Yeah. I have no question, Mary, but I'm so, so grateful for what you've done tonight for us. Oh. Um, the wealth of beautiful images, the clearness of your explanation are almost overwhelming. I'm growing to be extremely grateful forever. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We cry. <laughs> it wants me to recite poetry, actually. <laughs> I can write a poem for you. Oh, that would be beautiful. I'm a poet. Oh, beautiful. I have a poet's heart, but not a poet's pen. <laughs> well, um, yeah. let me see what I can do. Oh, and wonderful. Be, and you're all and invited to very... Michigan to hear me recite poetry under the stars. <laughs> yeah. So thanks. thank you so thank much. You, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, more questions, friends? Yeah. Oh, Hurley. Yeah, Mary Lynn would like to ask a yes. question. Uh -huh. Hello, Mary Lynn. I'd just like to bring together what you've been telling us a little more with what's happening in the world right now. Everyone thinks it's such a disaster that's going on. One thing after another that has... Um, interfered the li with the lives of people all over the world. But isn't this a world coming together 
in the same problem? And could this not be something that that we can help turn to the good? Mm. This is a very big question. And I can, and thank you for it. I can't really answer it. But what I would say is that I do agree that there is a coming together at the same time that we see a destruction and a tearing apart. And one of the first places that I go in experiences like this in my thinking is that I think of the, the words of the Christ being to his disciples when he says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And how can we find that in the experiences of, of the day and the time in which we find ourselves? And how can we meet the incongruity and, the in, and the, the, what seems so incomprehensible? I mean, this is, you know, the, the first, kind of the first step in knowledge of the higher worlds to, if we are passing judgment, then we can learn nothing more from what's happening. Mm -hmm. Very, very difficult to hold the heart open to try to come to understanding. And Venus, I didn't say this, but just prior to the Christmas conference in 1925, Rudolf Steiner gave that summer the lecture that's titled The Spiritual Individualities of the Planets. Mm -hmm. And there he describes that the planet Venus is not interested in what's going on in the cosmos around. He gives a very, he says, at least in the translation that I have, Burley, you would know if it's translated correctly, that, that uh, she's not interested in anything that's going on around in the cosmos, but is that this would offend her. Anything that would approach Venus it would be too offensive, but that Venus looks deeply into the heart of the human being to see what is mm. living. And so then when we think of that, and then the not only that Rudolf Steiner gives the foundation stone meditation for the first time as Venus is rising across the Eastern horizon and then closes the conference on January 1st in 1924 by saying, I have laid this into your hearts, mm. which he has just said a few months early, this is where Venus is looking. So Venus <laughs> looks to see, mm. how does this live in your heart? And so while we're moving through this current cycle of Venus, and, and any, you can pick up that eight year point at any point. I'm just saying, let's look at it from January, 2022 to January, 2030. But, you know, but just that to me, it's like Venus is looking into the heart of the human being to saying, okay, where is it? <laughs> where is that foundation? Stone? How is that living? What, what, mm -hmm. what in my life is a demonstration of that mystery? And I, so Marilyn, I, I'm not sure that I'm really answering what you, it, it, it's a mighty question, but it's like coming from the from the heart. Yes, and, and Venus heart. Venus is the planet of love too. Of love. Yes. <laughs> and love. I think everybody knows that we need more of that. Yes, as Byron would say, she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless mm. climes and starry skies. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Pamela, please. Uh, I think you answered my question in your last response. So you were talking about the eight year cycle of Venus. Yes. The significance of the 2004 to 12, and then the 12 to 2020. Yes. Then you started with the cycle from 2022. Because, yeah, the last retrograde conjunction of Venus and the sun was in 2020, 2020. And now this, the, the one that just happened in January is the next retrograde conjunction. Yeah. Okay. But you, it. yeah, I don't want to confuse that. Yeah, you just, so you just take a different starting point. Right. You just say, okay, where am I going to start? And I'm just saying, let's start right here because of because of all these things, we're coming, we're at this one, the, these 100 year rhythms are, are sounding out. Yes. And, and, and the, we're eight years away from 2030. Uh, that seems really awesome to me. Yes, we are. I, how, how, do we, how do we prepare? And how do we also 
uh, I'll just say this, it, it's maybe uh, more personal or more intimate. How do we move through some of these more sobering anniversaries? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was, I first started looking at it as, oh, this is something that takes us beyond that. So beyond the 100th anniversary of the fire, behind, beyond the 100th anniversary of Rudolf Steiner's death. Um, you know, it, it's still, we're, we're growing towards something. It's important, I think, to honor and respect and recognize the significance of the history and we have to go forward. Yeah, yeah. The way that you describe that then makes it like a chalice. Yeah, ah, oh, I liked, I liked that. In which, in which, you know, the anniversary and the death day and all the rest of these are carried. Yes. It's really us that have the responsibility. Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. of us, all of us. Carry, right, <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Um, any more questions, statements, or thank yous? Yeah, please don't be shy. Travis, uh, Travis, go ahead. Thank, uh, thank you, you Andre, and thank you, Mary. I just want to—I don't really have a question, but I did just want to say thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just listened quicker as you talked faster, so uh, <laughs> I just keep the information coming. And I really appreciated, you know, your comments of what you said about uh, kind of addressing maybe some of the pessimistic attitude that some people have, uh, you know, about the future of anthroposophy. And as you were saying that. I thought about the Lord's Prayer and that version that you gave in a workshop I attended. And, and I thought about, you know, for in thy being, no, you know, um, you know, for the tempter is but illusion and deception through, you know, uh, through out of which thou, O Father, leadest us through the light of thy knowledge. And I thought this is the knowledge that leads us through that delusion and that deception that Armand is bringing. And I think anthroposophists, you know, are being deceived and they're falling. So we've got to continue to bring this knowledge forth because truly our spiritual battle is just now beginning. Yes. yes. We are just now. And this group of anthroposophists incarnated now will be coming back together quickly. This is not the end. This is not, you know, this is our time for courage and strength and to go forward. So yes, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Uh, friends, more questions? Thank you. Oh, Laureen. Yes. I, hi, Mary. Hi, hi Laureen. <laughs> um, earlier, you mentioned about the North Node that had to do with, okay, that. I was wondering, uh, would you just sort of fill out that picture a little more? What does it mean, the North Node of the Foundation Stone, right? Or, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so when we're on the Earth, we see the moon orbiting. And the plane of the moon's orbit is not the same as the plane of the Earth's orbit. They're tilted by a few degrees to one another. So if the Earth's orbit is going like this, the moon is going around it like this, right? Mm -hmm. it. So it's intersecting at two points. And those points are called the nodes. So there's yeah. a descending node where the moon is going down and an ascending node where it's coming up. And these are interpreted astrologically as destiny points where when astrologically, if you look at the birth chart of an individual, you can see where was the south node and where was the north node. They're always exactly opposite each other. And they go in the opposite direction of the planet. So it's almost like they're scooping up all of the experiences that we're having and then rhythmically dropping them off so that we can assess where am I in my destiny path? Yeah. So events will happen in this 18 and a half year rhythm that are connected to the node or in the Waldorf school, there's this talk about the nine year change that happens with the child. This is connected to the halfway, the half rhythm of the node where the North node is in the position of the South and the South is in the position of the North where it's like you're looking back through the door that you walked through to come into this life and then that door closes. And now you want to be learning about the local geography, uh, the verbs, the things that come in the fourth grade curriculum that have to do with helping the child be here in this life now. And so if you look at it as the moment that's related to the laying of the foundation stone. So at that moment, uh, or at that time on September 20th in 1913, the moon would have, the moon's node would have 
we say it again, the nodes of the moon, there's two, would have occupied a particular place in the zodiac. So the south node, you could say, all right, this is not a, an individual biography, but this is a, a, an event, this is a deed. And does the south node have a relationship with what's informing this deed out of the past? And is the north node how it intends, you know, what it's reaching toward? What, where, where is its future going? And so given that Rudolf Steiner is initiated to a very high degree, it seems to me that this north node would represent the, the, the point through which was an inscription was being made into starry spaces. And he says this, such is the writing of the stars, our own deeds inscribed into the starry spaces. So this is as though something that's being inscribed there. And, and it's like he's saying, I'm doing this while Mercury is witnessing it. Mercury is the only thing that's mentioned. Doesn't mention a constellation. Oh, he does say Libra, but he doesn't mention any of the other planets. Doesn't mention, you know, but that, that signature is really specific. And I think that it's what was happening just a few days ahead of time that starts to show like, oh, this is a, this is a face-to-face -face moment mm -hmm. with the microcosm and the macrocosm, which is stage six or yeah, uh, stage five on the Rosicrucian path. You know, this, this harmony between the macrocosm and the microcosm. So I, it, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's thanks. great, Mary, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you generally for the presentation. It's wonderful to bring together in my own um, work with the foundation stone, the starry realm. And yeah. so thank yeah. you for this union okay. that you've offered. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, well, there's a, that also is an entirely different lecture about all of the way that the, the rhythms are related to. Yes. This. But thank you. Yeah. Thank you for carrying that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, more questions, guys. Okay, I think we are complete. Uh, so, dear friends, I think it's a good time to say thank you so much to Mary for very enthusiastic and very detailed presentation. And before we will unmute, unmute ourselves and uh, we'll greet Mary and say thank you. So, uh, yes, um, about video. So request for video, please uh, send to me, to my email. This is aonegin.rschicago.org. So our younger generation still, still working on our website. I don't think it's going to be done soon. So they said like a two months, you know, maybe. So that's why I will personally distribute uh, uh, videos. So, and we will see it again in slow motion. Yeah, <laughs> you can press pause. <laughs> With poses, yes. I mean, it's it's good. It's very good. And um, also, it's coming very, very quick. It will be presentation of Torin Finzer, our former general secretary. And uh, Torin will cover certain aspects of present situation. And uh, his presentation uh, title is Beyond, Beyond of Polarization, World Events, seen through the lens of anthroposophy. It's going to be Monday, uh, March 28th, 7 p.m. Uh, Central Time. And thank you so much, dear friends, for joining us. Uh, and now please unmute yourself and greet Mary and greet each other. Thank you, you for joining. Will you say your uh, email address again, please? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I will send it. I, I think I send it just right now. Okay. Everyone. Thank you. Okay. Everyone in the meeting. Thank yes. you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. 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 We're looking forward to Santa Fe. Hey, yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you for saying so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Andrew, for organizing all of these really incredible presentations. Thank you.
Thank you, Yaya, for joining. It's 3 a.m. in uh, London, I believe. Or no, it's, uh, it's getting up to 2 a.m. Oh, wow. 2 a.m. So for you are here on the yeah. Thank you so much. Mary, you provided vision for new aspects of relationship with the stars. Ah, Thank wow. You. Great. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. John Stephen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Beautiful as always, Mary. Thank you. Oh, Robin, thank you. Good to see you. Same here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I'm really grateful that I was asked to share. Thank you for refreshing this society as well. Ah. <laughs> Absolutely invaluable mm. and inner sensing um, validated by many among us tonight, I believe. Mm. Yes. I, wonderful. Thank you. That makes me cry. <laughs> me too. <laughs> because it's so important. It's so important. Absolutely. We have a responsibility to, as Rudolf Steiner says, provide souls that have nourishment to the world spirit. Yeah. We must. There's room for a lot of souls to join in this work and it's time. Yeah. Yes. Too so often true. we see obstacles. We should see opportunities. Yes. yes. You are right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. If you come to North Carolina, please stop. And I will. You know, I have grandchildren in North Carolina. I know. Yeah. I've been waiting to hear that you were coming. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe soon. <laughs> I'll send a shooting star ahead of myself. <laughs> we'll be on the lookout. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, dear friends, thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you for our meetings again, yeah. starting on Monday 28th. Thank Bye, you, Anna. Yeah. Bye. Thank you again, Mary. So thank I will you. email thank you soon. You, Mary. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you, Bernie. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.